Great comment, Sissy, who's sitting next to Mark right here in the front row. The first woman whose nomination for vice president went to a vote, and that was in 1972, saying that, look at this all-woman panel. Uh, uh, we hope later in the panel, um, Harry Belafonte will be joining us. He's just taking... Uh, the uh, train from New York, um, not exactly the Underground Railroad right now, but hopefully that Above Ground Railroad will get here on time. I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! And I hope... I hope all of you get these flyers that show where Democracy Now! broadcast just in Washington. Um, we, you know, we're now on not only your great Pacifica radio station, WPFW, and I hope you all support it, but on Howard University's PBS station, WHUT, and we just went on Maryland Public Television as well. Um, but we are here to talk about change, past, present, and most importantly, the future. And if it's any indication where we're headed, the last month that, um, I mean, here we are in Washington, D.C. The politicians are in a total stalemate, right? Talks just broke down once again today. But I do believe the people have spoken in a way that is an indication of, well, that other superpower, the most important one, which are the people of this country and around the world, when they stopped, when you stopped, when people all over the country of every political stripe stopped the military strike against Syria. I mean, I think there was this feeling of inevitability about it. Somehow, President Obama, who'd become president, uh, because, uh, some might say, because he opposed the war in Iraq, the most significant difference during the primaries between him and Hillary Clinton, um, that the fact that he was the one pushing forward unilaterally and then thinking, okay, if I can't get it unilaterally, I'll just go my, to my war ally, Britain, and we'll get the approval and we'll go together. And it was the British prime minister who said he had to go to his parliament first, expecting fully that he would get this approved. And for the first time in 150 years, the members of parliament said no to their prime minister to authorize a war. And that was because of the people of Britain. And here was President Obama totally shaken by that. But I mean, then he had to turn to his Congress. And those in his party, and of course, um, his natural opponents, the Republicans, but the ones in his party who wanted to do everything for President Obama, especially at this difficult time, hearing from their districts, I mean, 95% is an underestimate of those who are opposed to a strike in Syria. It's not only the organized peace movement, but when the organized peace movement is reflected everywhere in every community, you know you've made enormous strides. Where do we go from here? And what has happened in every realm, from foreign policy to the economy? That's what we're going to talk about right now. And we're gonna begin, and I think it's wonderful to begin with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, because as we talk about movements, it's also critical to talk about independent media as a democratic media movement where we need to be able to have a forum where people's views at the grassroots are reflected. Not that small circle of pundits we get in all the media who know so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. But hearing the voices like you do on Democracy Now!, like you do in The Nation magazine, like you hear Katrina on all of the networks, she's unusual, she is not one of those pundits. So, 
Katrina Vanden Heuvel, you all know as the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine, uh, frequent uh, contributor uh, on all the different networks, bringing a very dissonant point of view and dis dissident one. Uh, she also writes for the Washington Post and is the author of The Change I Believe in, uh, Fighting for Progress in the Age of Obama, Meltdown, How Greed and Corruption Shattered Our Financial System and How We Can Recover, and co-editor of Take Back America and Taking Down the Radical Right, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Thank you. It is a, uh, it is a great joy to be in a room full of creative dissenters, sane people. Too often on these weekends, I'm in a room with George Will. No. <laughs> um, I am, um, I want to just uh, congratulate IPS on being so young. Uh, and I can get away with saying that. The nation turns 150 in uh, about 18 months. Founded in 1865. But over these last great 50 years, the nation has enjoyed a long and deep relationship with IPS and his fellows, Mark Raskin. Woo! The extraordinary board member, Roger Wilkins, and the inimitable Barbara Ehrenreich joined recently. Longtime director, Robert Borisage, who's been a great ally. And then just a word for Saul Landau, a lifelong friend and contributor to the nation who did extraordinary investigative work in the pages of the nation to uncover the complicity of the Chilean and U.S. intelligence community in the assassination of his good friend, Orlando Letelier, Allende's foreign minister. And in so doing, he did a great service that we must continue. The nation has also, in, this, in these last years, collaborated with IPS on a special issue called The New Inequality. This was published in 2008. It could be published tomorrow. Sadly, the numbers would only show how much more the 1% have gotten, but we can, uh, did that together, won many awards, and one of the value, Amy spoke of independent media. What we like to do at The Nation is lift up the ideas that IPS, The Nation, you in this room believe in, and over these last months, the ideas of financial transaction tax, climate change, fair trade movements, ju civil rights, peace and, uh, ju peace and justice organizing, and the nation and IPS, all of you, we've joined in protest wars, we've even stopped some. We've tackled corporate greed, inhumane trade agreements, and just your basic and general passel of official folly and lies. <laughs> we like to think of ourselves both as speaking truth to power. Uh, perhaps one of the greatest collaborations, since this is about history, was between IPS and the nation came in 1976 when Orlando Letelier who, as you know, joined IPS after the US-inspired coup against Allende, warned in a prophetic 1976 Nation article, published just one month before his assassination on Washington streets, of the brutal shock therapy inflicted on the Chilean people by the Chicago School of Economists, and a man who is too often lionized in this country instead should be in the dock, Milton Friedman. And <laughs> Letelier's profoundly prescient piece detailed the dangers of the neoliberal doctrines that the Washington consensus would enforce first on the developing world and eventually on the so-called first world years later. Now, what's important about it is I think we're coming out of that moment. I think there is the possibility if people power can be mobilized, as Amy and others have spoken of, to break free of the shackles of that neoliberal doctrine, which is so damaged, ravaged, and hurt so many. <coughs> And bringing history to bear on the present is much of what the nation does. Our great columnist Naomi Klein, in her book, important book, The Shock Doctrine, years later after Orlando Letelier's article in The Nation, devoted a chapter in her book, The Shock Doctrine, to that very piece, trying to educate, that sounds too paternalistic because a younger generation knows far more than I do, but to try to enlighten and bring some history to bear on a generation, let's be honest, who in this country has been raised on neoliberal doctrines. I mean, forget anything radical like Hyman Minsky, who I thought ran vaudevilles, but John Keynes is chapter 17 in the economic textbooks that young people are growing up with. So, but I, just on a personal note, I don't know about you, but I have moments of doubt and despair. I mean, I run the nation, you know? I mean, I took my daughter once to Jim Hightower's Rolling Thunder Tour because I would come home every day and go like, so I said, politics and mobilizing, organizing can be fun. 
But you know, when I have those moments, and by the way, my mantra during those sectarian battles on the left is let us battle injustice, not each other. But I want to just shout out to John Cavana, who has solace and counsel, but inspiration in phone calls and sometimes in a flurry of midnight emails. So I think of John, and I'm sure not alone, and one of the reasons we're here today, he's one of the great masters of progressive coalition building, providing that glue, the vision, the boundless energy that has held together many alliances across international borders and various issues. I just want just a word on how the IPS, IPS and the nation are not just collaborative, collaborative institutions. We're also family. Brothers and sisters, allied in a belief that ideas, big ideas matter. That rebuilding, reviving, and reclaiming our democracy, the work Sarita Gupta does every day, that George Gale does every day, that many in this room do every day, that that matters. That history matters, that social, cultural, and political movements build the most deeply transformative change, that matters. That independent organizing, creative dissent matter and that connecting movements at home and transnationally matters, especially in these moments and these times when you've heard brilliant panel with Amy and Phyllis Bennis, Amira Woods, on the uprisings around the world that are being, driving energy into our country. And that we need the strategies not only for today and tomorrow, which IPS provides, but also providing a long-term vision of a more just and peaceful society and world, that that matters, and challenging the limits of the debate Think of the suffocating consensus that's too often imposed upon us by, the, by a media which defines which viewpoints matter, what, 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 which defines reality. We have a new media. It's not that new, but it's come up. I mean, democracy now is extraordinary in its reach. The nation is reaching a new generation. We have independent media that can make a difference if we weave it together. Challenging the limits of the debate, and also something that I think IPS has done so brilliantly, is also the alternatives. Alternatives matter. Remember that terrible saying in a country which Amy is right, the people of that country forced our president to go to our Congress. But Margaret Thatcher had that expression, there is no alternative, wrong. There is an alternative. There is always, a history, there is always an alternative in, in history, politics, in media. And finally, activism in Europe, the global south, and Latin America matters to progress here in the United States. And in so, in that progress, as Amy said, as I will say, we need that truly independent, fearless media, putting underreported issues, views, and ideas on a radar that may be too thin right now and fragile, but is there. And finally, we need to learn how to do our work and sustain institutions, sadly, on a fraction of the budgets that our ideological foes and others have. But building and sustaining strong, vital institutions is why we are all here in this room today, to mark IPS's 50th and onwards. It is an institution. So as important as it is to combat, engage the causes and controversies of the moment, supporting the long-term change, the fundamental trajectory of this country demands that long-term building of institutions. We share that in between IPS and the nation. We share that t building of institutions and taking on the prevailing orthodoxy and narrow consensus and telling a different story. Telling a different story. I would just say like IPS, the nation has a very storied history. You know, Martin Luther King wrote a civil rights audit for the nation from 1961 to 1966. He spoke out against Vietnam and American militarism in a nation event six months before the the well-known Riverside Church speech. And in that, in what he told us about how the arc of history bends toward justice, it's important to remember that he understood and we understand that that arc doesn't bend by itself. It takes us, we, the people. And it takes myriad extraordinary and courageous activists and groups that have emerged in these last years and that are meeting here. John. Kavana told me how important it was that a Sarita Gupta meet a May Bove or a George Gale and find commonalities because in that solidarity we will build a stronger movement. So in these years ahead, at least another 50 for you, IPS, another 150 for us, and then onwards and onwards. Um, 
you know, we are going to reach new people um, and counter, at the nation, we are now reaching 500,000 people a week on different platforms. But what we need to do all together, and the media role is so critical, is counter the misinformation, the bigotry, and greed with tough, intelligent, principled journalism. That tough and critical-minded journalism is part of our editorial DNA, it is part of your organizing activism. But at the same time, I believe now is also a time for more enunciation and not simply denunciation. We need to lay out bold, bold alternatives that people will understand that they improve the conditions of their lives. I will end by saying we need those sweet victories. That's what I call them. And in the last few months, we've averted war, averted military strikes in Syria. We have kept Larry Summers off the Fed. Yeah. And in my city, you know, we're going to need to keep him accountable, but we are going to have a mayor, Bill de Blasio, who speaks about inequality and building a more fair and more just city and a progressive caucus in the New York City Council. So these are the principles that are key to making headway in the future. And if IPS can stay on the ramparts, as it has, uh, it can help us move forward uh, in the next 50 years. I just want to close with words I've always loved. Uh, Aaron Dottie Roy, someone whose spirit is close to IPS, has once said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. And on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you, Katrina. And I hope that you're preparing your questions and comments for a discussion afterwards. You know, it's hard to believe here in Washington that in order to prevent uh, millions of people from getting health care right now, the Republicans have put well over a million people out of work. It's unclear what the logic is. I just read the latest interesting story. Um, you know that, that Head Start immediately was being defunded, and it was a private foundation that put $10 million into keeping these kids cared for all over the country. But in case you were worried about the uh, Congress's children, their daycare is fully funded and has never been threatened. They did not have to turn to a private foundation. Um, you know, obviously, this would end today if Congress members were furloughed, uh, if their kids weren't being taken care of, if their very fine health care benefits were just put on hold for a little while. Um, so even as they are locked up um, with each other, people are moving forward. And I think Sarita Gupta is a very important, um, not only symbol of that, but engine of that. Uh, Sarita is the Executive Director of Jobs with Justice and American Rights at Work and serves as co-director of Caring Across Generations, a national coalition of 200 advocacy organizations working together for quality care and support and a dignified quality of life for all Americans. Um, she is one of those working in coalition who's responsible for some remarkable legislation and rule changes like the Department of Justice um, uh, requiring minimum wage and overtime protection for domestic workers, uh, like California. California and New York passing a domestic workers bill of rights but I'll let her describe both the organizing and also how we deal with this economy today. What is happening? Why the disparity and what can be done about it? Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, I am so excited to be here to help celebrate 50 years of the Institute for Policy Studies and really discuss the vision for the next 50 years um, that IPS and all of us in this room here can help lead. Um, I, too, um, am a huge John Cabana groupie. Uh, I'm sorry he's not in the room, um, because John is an amazing coalition builder, and it's true that a lot of the work in the workers' rights sector, economic justice sector that I'm a part of, 
um, John and, and the staff at IPS have played an incredible role in helping us figure out smart, thoughtful ways to really connect the movement for workers' rights and economic justice with the movement for climate change, with the movement around financial reform and the whole bit. And you know, I can't thank IPS enough for the incredible support of um, really listening to big ideas and alternatives and saying, you're not crazy. That's a great idea. Let's help you do that. Um, it's, an, it's an amazing home for me. And I, I'm a very proud board member of IPS and I'm excited to be here. So I want to take a step back from the framing for a moment um, because I don't think we can talk about radical new strategies for movement building if we don't first acknowledge that the times we're in are radically different. We don't just need new organizing strategies because our current strategies have failed to fully tackle the problems of the past. We need new organizing strategies because we face new challenges. Challenges with a level of scale and complexity and frankly danger that we've never really faced before. The last several decades, as you all know in this room, have seen a, we've seen a torrent of neoliberal economic policies defined by privatization, deregulation, union busting, corporate globalization, you all know this. The result isn't just the slashing of wages and working conditions, the loss of jobs, the decimation of small businesses, the rising gap between the super rich and the rest of us here and around the globe. Those, unfortunately, are just symptoms of the systemic reordering of the global economy to put massive capital on top and everything else, workers, the environment, community needs, democracy, you name it, on the bottom. The lack of steady employment and no employment really quickly are becoming the new normal in America as it continues unchecked, uh, unchecked as it spreads around the globe. One third of American families now live below the poverty line. Many of them work, but as we know, work doesn't make a difference when productivity is steadily rising, but wages continue to fall. Homelessness is growing, and among those who have homes, more and more of us are being displaced due to disasters, uh, like storms and food shortages, disasters that we call natural, but in which human beings very much have had a hand. If opportunity is a ladder in America, far too many in our nation are falling quickly down the greased rungs. And when we fall, there's no safety net to catch us. Instead of cushioning the collapse of American families most struggling in this imbalanced new economic order, politically motivated forces in politics, too frequently in both parties, have pushed cuts to social programs and other austerity measures that simply hasten this human economic and national decline. The result? For large multinational corporations, it's a golden era of untold wealth and prosperity. But for working people, who have always struggled, the new economic order is a gauntlet of constrained opportunity and disappearing support structures. These structural rearrangements are driven by global capital and are horrifying. But you know what else I think they are? Instructive. Because global capital thinks big, it thinks bold, and it thinks borderless, and so should we. In this moment, amidst these challenges, it's not enough to build organizations of workers to protest the powers that be and force concessions from capital. We should rewrite the very rules of the economy for the next generation and generations to come. structural power in the hands of workers. So what does that look like? This means innovative campaigns that don't just criticize industry, but actually destabilize destructive industry. Walmart being one of the chief examples in the retail and logistics industries. It's not enough for Walmart to just do a little bit better by workers and small businesses in our communities. Walmart needs to radically alter its business model or we need to radically alter Walmart's ability to operate in America. This has meant that we've had to redefine, as, as a workers' rights 
organization, we've had to redefine who is considered a Walmart worker. It is not only the retail workers in the stores that have been going on strike and taking bold action, but it's the crawfish workers on the Gulf Coast and the garment workers in Asia who supply to Walmart. It's the warehouse workers in Chicago and Los Angeles and New Jersey. All the millions and millions of subcontracted workers that are all Walmart workers, right? And it's when we begin to weave that understanding and that narrative to build enough power to actually take on the world's largest corporation in the world, that's when we can start to actually